ask that you look again to that portion of scripture that we just, uh, that Pastor Sam just read. Um, and, and this is uh, kind of, I, I guess, words of life and, and praise and justice kind of all kind of wrapped up together here when we think about this, um, this Passion Week. And so it's from you know, Matthew 21, 14 to 21. We see um, in the beginning of the chapter, you know, typically when we start here this time of the year, people are thinking we're going to go right into um, the sort of Palm Sunday message. But it begins um, what is known as the Passion Week where Jesus had... Uh, his disciples uh, again and again, and he had told them on more than one occasion, behold, we're going to go into Jerusalem, and the Son of Man it must be betrayed. And, and again, I don't know that they ever really got that. And so here we see earlier in the chapter, um, it was discussed the triumphant, uh, triumphal entry, which um, you know, Jesus made uh, upon the first day of the Passion Week, and, and this is five days before his death. Uh, with his disciples kind of leery, quite frankly, of what may await him. And so he enters into Jerusalem, as you know, earlier in that chapter, uh, first by way of Bethphage, which is near the Mount of Olives, or what is rendered in the Aramaic as the place of young figs. Um, and so there he kind of illustrated to his disciples, um, I would say, likely without them fully knowing what he was talking about. I think sometimes he said stuff and it, whew, a lot of it just kind of went over their head a bit. Um, but, but again, um, his superior knowledge being the fullness of the Godhead bodily, as Colossians would say, he's sort of uh, foretelling uh, them exactly where um, they would find a donkey tied and even what to say to the owner. And, and, and this is kind of the picture of humility earlier in that chapter where we see uh, the Lord say, the Lord hath need of it. When we all know the Lord really doesn't have need for anything. But, but, but this was sort of uh, a very much a, a, a picture or a portrait. Um, he, he could have conjured up a white stallion and came riding into town if, if he so desired. But, but again, this idea that he came riding in on a donkey uh, was certainly uh, a picture of humility. And, and again, if you kind of look at some of the scholars' uh, comments on this, it certainly wasn't serendipitous that he actually came in in this way. And so... He sat there, he, um, you know, coming in as the people shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, carrying palms. And I saw some of the palms in the back of the, the church there and, and other branches. And, and this was certainly uh, emblematic of victory and success. And Hosanna means, as you guys know, save now, save now. And so, again, you, you think about this and, and <laughs> just eight days later, the same people that were saying Hosanna, Hosanna are going to be saying crucify him, crucify him. And so the reality is, is we see, we think, I guess, an idea that, 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 that these people weren't necessarily getting it. In some cases, many of them thought that he would overthrow the Roman oppression and that he would take the kingdom by force. But what I don't think they quite understood is that he came to inaugurate this kingdom, not to consummate the kingdom at this point. And so in verse 14, where we pick up, that's sort of the intro to our text, we see Jesus... And it says, uh, uh, and again, it says, we see him after driving the buyers and sellers from the temple. He invites the blind and the lame in after expelling those who abuse the temple. But again, he gives grace to those who come to humbly seek this, this temple not made of hands. And again, you think about this. Um, we see the house of God today being used for merchandise. Um, and again, you see that back in the day of Jesus, but again, uh, for this idea of gain, shepherds and under shepherds are to care and support sheep. Amen. But they're not supposed to slaughter sheep. That's a butcher. That's not a shepherd. Again, again, it's a very different profession when you start thinking about, about sheep. And so again, um, you, you know, Jesus is not really, you know, into the bingo and, and the selling raffle tickets and dinners and everything. But, but he's saying that my church, this house is going to be a house of prayer. And so when we pray for our, our assembled, because again, we are the church, amen? We are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones. But when we pray for this building with which we do worship, let's keep in mind that perspective, Amen that the perspective that this house is a house of prayer. And again, if we pray the way that, that we should pray, then a lot of these other things that sometimes we were worried about, they're going to fall in place on their own. Amen? And see, in verse 15, um, and I'll just kind of take a quick 
peek and go right to it. It says, and when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were super excited. No. They were sore displeased. We see the scribes and the Pharisees, and the young people today would, would use the phraseology that they were giving, that, the, that these were the people that were giving Jesus shade. You know, young people know what to tap your, your dad and your mom and tell them what that means. And, and it's okay, we're giving them shade, right? And, and so they were jealous, and it was not uncommon in that day for children to be a part of the rabbinical worship. And to see children crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna the highest, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Um, uh, again, um, a kind of a, a little bit of a bonus track here. This is kind of reminiscent of, uh, of how um, they responded. As you recall in John's account in chapter 11, when Jesus raised Jer uh, Jer um, Lazarus from the dead, and after he had been dead, how many days? Four days. And again, in verse 47 there, they said, some of them, what are we accomplishing? I'm talking about the shaders, the haters, okay? This, this is how they manifested themselves at a meeting of the Sanhedrin back in chapter 11. They said, what are we accomplishing? Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Uh-oh. That sounds a whole lot less like a group of people uh, trying to guard the sanctity of what they believe the word is and people trying to guard their cushy positions. They will come and upseat us and take us and take our t temple and our nation. And again, Jesus is never interested in our comfort. He is always interested in his will being done. Amen. The comfort piece is usually our portion that we're concerned about. And so, again, they weren't concerned about the doctrine being perverted or, or her heresy. But, but again, at the core of it, it was, I guess, more primal than that. It was more about their choice seats in the temple and the nation and the fact that all the people are going to flock and believe after him. And so, again, um, you see, Jesus did something that was so undeniable at that particular point in time. The world had never seen anybody raised from the dead, not graveyard dead, after being dead for four years. He had raised Jairus' daughter uh, from the grave in Luke chapter 8, and she had just died, remember? And the widow of Nain's son in Luke chapter 7, on the way to the cemetery, ha had been raised from the dead. But never, ever had this happened before. And I'm here to say that sometimes, in order for God to do something in our lives that we've never seen him do, there may be things that happen in our lives that we've never seen happen. Amen. And so Mary and Martha were distraught that Jesus, not so much that Lazarus died. They were distraught about that, but they were distraught. Our friend hears that, that, that Lazarus, our brother, is sick and he doesn't come right away. He almost kind of goes, sit back and relax. It's going to be all right. Sit back and relax. And again, you think about Mary, who spent so much time at his feet. I actually believe, and I've said this before, I think when things don't go the way we believe they should in a, in a godly fashion, the worshipers, I think they take it the hardest because they're like, I'm at your feet. I'm worshiping you and, and not us. We're your friends. And so again, um, again, what we see, and I love this verse, it says that uh, when Jesus said to Martha, Martha said, uh, yes, I believe that he will rise again in the resurrection at that last day. But Jesus said to her, and, and it was as though he was saying, I don't think you're quite getting it. You see, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, though he were dead, yet will he live again. He will never die. And he said, do you believe this? That's what he said. He said, listen. All this other stuff, the fact that I could have came earlier, and you can kind of map that whole trip out, how long it would have taken him if he would have started to embark upon the trip to come back at the time he first heard that Lazarus was sick and he wasn't sick. And he, I mean, you can, you can map that whole thing out. But in the end, he says, I am the resurrection. It's not about, listen, yes, there's going to be a resurrection on the last day, but you're looking at the embodiment of the resurrection. I am the resurrection. In me is life. I'm life. And she, he said, do you believe this? And it's as though he was looking right through time past this book at all of us saying, do you believe this? 
do you believe that you believe I'm the resurrection because if you believe that I am the resurrection and that the resurrection isn't an event but the resurrection is a person if you get that the rest of your life is gonna look totally different because in me is life and so again what we see is the fact that, 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 that the whole perspective, and you gotta understand what happens after this. The Sanhedrin at this point, at that point, they sought to kill him because it's like, wait a minute. The fact that this word is spreading, you know, it's almost like, you know, whisper down the lake, Lazarus is alive, Lazarus is alive, Lazarus is alive. What, what, Lazarus, was he dead, was he dead, was he dead? And all of a sudden, every time they saw Jesus, they saw the fact that they couldn't get their arms wrapped around the fact because the Jews believed that the body, that the spirit lay close to the body for three days. Again, I don't think it was an idiosyncratic event that it was four days that Lazarus was raised from the dead after that. It was to say, no, he didn't swoon. He didn't faint. It wasn't bad meat or fish. He was dead. And he said, Lazarus come forth and him that was bound in grave clothes dead came forth walking and they said release him cut the grave clothes off of him let him free that's a whole message in and of itself some of us are walking around with grave clothes on knowing that we are alive we're walking around with grave clothes on and Jesus said no grave clothes are for people in the grave he's alive loose him and let him go some of you all you're not walking in your potential in Christ because you're walking around with linen and aloe and frankincense and myrrh wrapped around your body grave clothes but you're not dead you're alive in Jesus Christ amen and every time they saw Lazarus they had to come to grips with the fact that he was a living epistle read of men it was the fact that that's why they wanted to not just kill Jesus, they wanted to kill Lazarus because it's like he's a constant reminder of the fact that this man raised him from the dead. And so again, when we are salt and light in the earth, people look at us and they should look at us the same to every time they see me walking, every time they see Brother Glenn walking, Brother Paul walking, Brother Mason, they should say, that is an example of a person that was a dead man walking that's now alive. They should see us the same way they saw Lazarus, amen? And we, we thank the Lord again. So again, I, I stepped on a little bit of a tangent here, but, but, but the reality is, is that we often can be like the Pharisees. Jesus can disrupt our, comfort, our comfortable seats and his miracles in our lives should be a living epistle that require us to consistently take that seriously. So back to the text in verse 16, I'm still Matthew 20, uh, 21. And, and said unto him, this is what they said. Again, they were sore displeased the shaders and haters. And they said, hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, yea, have ye not read? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. See, again, I love Jesus because he knows how to hit the right people in the right way. He says, have you not read? And I think it was somewhat of a rhetorical question because it's like you Pharisees, people who read the law, and you know, have you not read? Of course you, it's one of the highest kind of uh, a, a, a diss, so to speak, to them to say, well, you're supposed to have read everything. Have you not read? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. They wanted him to rebuke them. He's like, I'm not going to rebuke them because they are saying that which is true. And again, you can see in 1 Corinthians 15, Ephesians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 2, again, uh, uh, God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound those things which are wise. Don't you know that if we get to a place where we don't praise God, that not only will the rocks cry out, I believe that these babies are going to understand that, 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 the, that the heavens declare the glory of God and they'll worship the Lord just like we see these kids worshiping the Lord. So again, if you're too cute, too pretty, too whatever it is, get out of the way and let a young person worship and praise. Amen? Again, because the reality is, is he, everything that they sang, everything we know, if he is all of that, then Hosanna, this shout of praise should come forth out of us. And again, and after Jesus confounds them in verse 17, it says he left them and he went out to the city of Bethany and he lodged there. And again, he is as though he throws down the mic and he walks off to Bethany. And he says there, 
He, some say he left Jerusalem at night to go to Bethany because he was sort of on the lamb, but to dispel any notion that he was going to upset the government and take the control of the city by force, he spent time there with friends. It was often a place that he would, uh, again, he, he wasn't trying to take uh, a, a city by force. He wasn't trying to upset and uproot the government because he had been saying his kingdom was not of this earth. And so again, he, he, he wasn't running from officials uh, and he wasn't weak, uh, but very much a thoughtful decision. So Jesus returns to the city, and he was, he was hungry. And again, it, implying that uh, if you read down uh, in verse 18, now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And he saw a fig tree in the way, and he came to it, and he found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto him, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever, and presently the fig tree withered away, or some uh, translations might say, at that moment, it withered away. And a little bit of background about uh, figs and fig trees. Uh, maybe more than you'd ever want to know about figs, but I'll give you a few points. These fig trees were likely of the capra fig uh, variety, capra fig variety. And they were uh, kind of a wild variety, um, not privately owned. So again, in that part of the area, you could probably see them uh, pretty much just about anywhere. And they produced three series of fruit. They produced a spring fruit, a summer fruit, and a winter fruit. And the fruit of this particular type of tree, it's thought, was typically that which appeared before the leaves, OK? So again, the idea is that the fruit would appear and the leaves would appear later, which is a little bit counterintuitive, it would seem. And so Jesus sees green leaves from afar. And though he knows that given the timing of the year, it's understandable that there was no fruit. But given the green leaves, he expects to see fruit. Watch where I'm going. So the fig tree is illustrative of, of Israel. They made a profession of true religion, meaning there was the appearance of something good. But they considered themselves as the peculiar people of God, and they despised, and they were reprobate of all others, and they were only hypocrites, having nothing of faith in profession. So basically, leaves and no fruit. And again, for many of us, the scripture says this, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good from evil. Meaning, that's a scripture on spiritual maturity. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Not milk belonging to them that are of full age, but strong meat. Meaning that at a certain point in time, when I look at Zoe, and I look at myself, and I look at other adults here, there is a progression of what we would think the kind of food is that's appropriate for that age. And so when Jesus sees green leaves, because of this variety of fig, the expectation is, is that I should see fruit because the maturity in the cycle should say that fruit would have appeared before the leaf. And so when we present our lives, hear me, when we present our lives and people see, I'm a member of Monco Bible Fellowship, and I sing in the praise group, and I work in this ministry, and I do that, the expectation that they should have, rightfully, is that they'll see fruit that's commensurate with the green leaves of our building, with the green leaves of the work we do, of the stuff we're always talking about to our friends and family. And so the truth of the matter is, is we have an obligation, because what we see Jesus doing here is saying, listen, if you're not bringing forth the kind of fruit that's commensurate with your maturity, then there's a different discussion that he's having. And so the reality is, is, is there's a lesson, the fanfare that we saw when Jesus arrived. It, it, again, they, it wasn't so spiritual. They expected him to be the overthrower of leadership. The temple, by all appearances, should be the place of concentrate, uh, consecration and worship. And again, what he finds in that temple, green leaves, it looks like it should have been a place of worship. He finds in that dice shooting and all kind of crazy stuff, right? Let it not be said that we are a, a mature body of believers and yet an appearance of greenness throughout our website, throughout our signage, and yet somehow or another, the fruit of the spirit, love and of joy and of peace and of long suffering, those fruits that they should expect to see. That is the obligation we have as believers. Amen. 
And I believe this is if in fact there is fruit, people that are hungry will come and consume it. We don't have to hand out yellow cards. We don't have to give big fanfares. Fruit, people that are hungry come and eat a fruit. Amen? People that are hungry come and eat a fruit. And so that's the charge. And we see Jesus so eloquently in this particular uh, passage sort of allowing us. It's been a lesson about Israel. And, and, and again, we see the appearance of green from afar, but no fruit. And again, it's almost like the nobleman. And I, I appreciate uh, the, the um, uh, reality of the... Um, uh, the the uh, presentation that Brother Irvin, Brother um, Tony Henderson did yesterday about stewardship. In Luke 19, he told his uh, servants to occupy until he came back, expecting to see increase. And while some of the servants invested and worked in the marketplace and showed increase, the one wicked servant didn't. And the same one in Luke 19, 20 came back saying, Lord, behold, this is the pound that you've given me. I've kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared that you were an austere man, and thou takest up what thou layest not down, and thou reaps where thou did not sow. He gave him, as uh, my buddy uh, Pastor Sally said, he gave him church talk, basically. It's like, yeah, I know you are an austere man, and you, you take up what you not sow, and then you almost hear organ playing in the background, right? It's like, he's like, listen, man, show me the money. It's like, you're my agent, Jerry, listen. I pay you, show me the money. <laughs> He's like, I, you don't know what it's like. Me representing you, it is an uphill battle. He's like, I hear all that. I know it's an uphill battle, but you need to show increase. Not church talk, not rhetoric, but increase. And so again, that's the fruit obligation that we see here. And the nobleman said, occupy until he comes. Uh, again, we see um, that charge to us occupy and, and, and be fruitful and, 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 and multiply in this earth and again subdue it. All those things that were the charge in, in uh, Genesis are our charge now. And so now, again, uh, just going to kind of hurry down a little bit. Um, uh, if you go down to verse 20, again, it says, and when the disciples saw it, talking about the fig tree, they marveled, saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? And Jesus lets them know that by faith that we are to believe that nothing is impossible with God and therefore that what he has promised, he will certainly perform and it may seem impossible to us. Um, and again, if you look in this geographic area, the Mount of Olives looms large for all to see. But but the big idea here is that if you have faith in an even bigger God um, asking in prayer, all uh, is possible with God. And again, I think sometimes problems loom so large and I think about even our election and, and many of us are just um, in an honest moment um, quite quite concerned and dare I say some people are quite terrified at the notion that um, there does not seem to be the kind of responsible leadership waiting on the wings to be plugged in and again but our God reigns and we've got to always remember that it doesn't matter what we see and again one of the scriptures I know uh, Pastor Sam and all I always quote light affliction is but for a moment but it works in us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory for we look not after the things that are seen because they're temporal but the things that are not seen those are the ones that are eternal and so again God's not God's playing from a different playbook he's not looking at just what we're looking at God is saying no in the spirit I'm working all things together according to my counsel I'm doing that unless we forget that we have a God who is spirit and again we worship him in spirit and in truth so again it's like he's got a different playbook than the playbook that we have and so we praise him for that and so again, in John 14, 12, Jesus reminded them, I tell you the truth, that anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. And he will do even greater things than these because I'm going to my father. It, it, again, it's not because, you know, we say the magic phrases and we know how to push the manipulative buttons and all the right words. But it's because of the God that's in us. And uh, again, just going to keep going through here. Um, uh, if you look at uh, verse 22, all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing that you shall receive. And again, 
this is faith. The, 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 when you think about Hebrews, faith being the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, the essence of faith is understanding that we rely on a holy God. If you think about uh, Hebrews 11.3, it says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things that are seen are not made of things that do appear. It's a reality of things that are occurring that we don't see. And that you got to get, you got to grasp that. You have to appreciate that. And again, God can do above that which we can see. And, and one of my favorite passages of the reality of God doing bigger things than we've ever seen is, is in Joshua 10. You got to remember that Joshua spoke to the Lord that day when the uh, Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he had sat and said in the sight of Israel, son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. And thou moon in the valley of Agilon. He basically said, we need a little more daylight to beat these guys. And, God, and he said, he had the nerve to say to God, I want the sun to stay right where it is and not go down. And the scripture says, and the sun, verse 13, Joshua chapter 10, the sun stood still and the moon stayed. Until the people, y'all are not hearing me, until the people avenged themselves upon their enemies. The sun did not move because the people needed daylight to complete the victory. And the scripture says, there has not been a day since nor a day afterwards where the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. The Lord did fight from Israel and hurl great stones out of heaven. How can you fight a God like that? Are you kidding me? God is saying, you know what? I'm going to give you a twofer. Not only am I going to let the sun stop, which if I see that, I don't even have to see the stones being hurled. I'm like... A God that keeps the sun up and it doesn't set. It's 10 o'clock. It's like, it's still shining. And all of a sudden, God steps out and says, and just in case you didn't know I was with these people, he hurled great stones from heaven at them. That's the God. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lest you not, so don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be dismayed. When we think about this triumphal entry, when we think about the era that God ushered in, and, and, and the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are fighting from victory, not for victory. Amen. And so when you think about that, be encouraged. Just know that the battle is already won. No grave could hold him down. He said, I laid down my life. No man takes it. And if I lay it down, I can lift it up again. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank him. He's good. Thank you, Jesus. Father, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord. Uh, thank you, God, that, that you, uh, your word is so complete with truth, Father. There's such a great encouragement.